This is Ambazonia Calling. News, analysis, commentary, opinion, editorials. Ambazonia Calling is a co-production of Africa Freedom Network, The Missions Tribune, and Compass Free Press. Welcome. My name is Ntumfoin Bo Herbert, and I bring revolutionary greetings from our studios in Washington, D.C., to all of you, friends of Ambazonia and fellow Ambazonians on Ground Zero and across the globe. Congresswoman Karen Bass of California has refused to buy the two for five francs one and indivisible myth that La Republique du Cameroon has been auctioning. I am innocent here. Colonial Cameroon can actually forfeit a right to a territorial integrity if its government does not represent all the peoples belonging to the territory without distinction as to race, color, or creed. This is Tanya Jude Agua Ozugen. Is Congresswoman Karen Bass truly interested in finding out the root causes of the genocide in Ambazonia and who the culprits are? This is Manjong Jude Ambe. Reopening schools would have been an easy operation, except that it is not that easy. This is Lambert Mbom. And so we are fighting for our survival. We are fighting for our existence. We do not uh, support enablers who think Ambazonia should remain a colony under Cameroon. Now, I'm going to talk. Say that king gay. You don't distract for them. Fine. You don't kill them. Fine. From the lions, then, our brothers and sisters give us a clear and unambiguous lesson on the way forward. This is Manjong Jut Ambe. The fact that the government party engages in the negotiations in bad faith should not be a reason for the pro-independence movements to refuse negotiations. This is the mark. Listen, Mr. Meme, we are, we, are, we are not going to negotiate at, at the point of fear. And at the same time, fear is not going to stop us from negotiating. Amazonians can choose the Swiss-led process which is real and available, or they can run after illusions. This is really brought a day. This is edition number 056 of Ambazonia Calling of Sunday, the 14th of July, 2019. Oh, freedom, freedom is coming, freedom is coming, freedom is coming. First, accept apologies for late delivery of this and at least our last six editions. I have good news though, we just got bumped up to earlier in the day, so you should expect henceforth to have Ambazonia calling in your inbox when you wake up on Sunday morning on Ground Zero, which means Washington DC gets Ambazonia calling six hours before dawn on Sunday. That said, a hearty welcome again to Ambazonia Calling. As usual, we have another jam-packed edition for you today. It is not only that we have content, it is that we have exclusive content. Content you can only hear on Ambazonia Calling. This is the experience of Amba people, when the flames of the freedom fan by truth light on the hearts of the children. There is a fire on the mountain, fire on the mountain, there is a fire on the mountain, fire on the mountain, run, run, bring some water, run, 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 bring some water. We will begin this edition with editorialist Lambert Mbom, who in today's editorial sets out to school the few misguided people, those who pretend to care for Ambazonian children, 
because they are not in school right now, but care very little for their safety, for the safety of their parents, and who seem to think that insecurity is the perfect condition for children to get an education. One of the most recurrent inflection points in the Ambazonia Revolution is the issue of schools. To reopen schools in September or not to reopen? That anew is the question, reposed for the umpteenth time since teachers, parents, students and lawyers first triggered a set of strikes in 2016. Many schools have been shut down for two years or more. Many have been torched. Some frightening stories have been told of students, teachers, principals kidnapped or taken hostage. Soldiers for the colonizers have raided at least two schools and kidnapped students in style no different from Boko Haram's kidnapping of the Chibok girls. Reopening schools would have been an easy operation, except that it is not that easy. Which is what makes letters written from jail by the father of the coffin revolution, Mancho Bibixi and others, advocating for school resumption, providing directives easier said than done. Those, including UNICEF and other international partners who are rightly concerned that students have been out of school for so long, are only half right. If they care only for the right of the children to education, they really don't care because a dead child cannot learn. With war still raging, with government ministers escorted in armored personnel carriers into and around Ambazonia, with congressional delegations coming in from the United States unable to visit Ambazonia on account of insecurity, it is foolhardy just to call for school resumption. They are all hypocrites. All these more caring than thou people who shed crocodile tears about students being out of school. Who bother more about schooling than about creating the conducive environment for children to obtain an education? For it must be said, it is one thing to go to school and quite another to obtain an education. Schools were not closed because there was opposition to children getting an education. The boycott of schools was made inevitable by the brainwashing and francophonizing system of half education that the colonizers had in place. Ever since that complaint was first tabled and students at the University of Boya, for example, called for no violence as they went on strike, not a single meaningful reform has been implemented in response to the people's demands. The world has failed to force the colonizers to implement the reforms the people have demanded and paid such a high price for over the past three years. They are taking cover behind the right to education to stampede Ambazonians to return to the status quo, which they originally denounced and have actively fought against. Ambazonia will be better off with a generation of supposedly illiterate students who are safe than to have another generation of Ambalanders brainwashed into accepting second-class citizenship in another man's land. The hypocrites who are calling for schools to resume have not yet called for the occupation forces to withdraw from the hundreds of villages they have torched. The hypocrites have not yet called on the regime which torched schools to rebuild them before schools can reopen. They have not yet put in place a program for returnees to be resettled in their reconstructed villages and to live there free of fear to raise and educate their families. The return to schools in September is a political campaign which benefits the colonizers more than it benefits any children. It is all about the colonizers claiming that life has returned to normal in Ambazonia, that the campaign for independence has been crushed, that Ambazonians are so sick of the boycott of schools that the only thing they want more than peace and independence is to have their children enroll anew in the colonial system they have sacrificed lives to achieve. Colonialism begins by the colonizers imposing their education system on the colonized people. It is what France has done to La République du Cameroon, including by putting in place what they call Les Accords de Coopération, under which colonial pact France determines the curriculum for Cameroon while Cameroon imposes an annexationist agenda on Ambazonia. The sacrifice of missing a few years in school is nothing compared to the sacrifice of youngsters who have been slaughtered in the genocidal violence Cameroon has perpetrated on Ambazonia. The only thing more important 
than restoring independence for Ambazonia is ensuring that Ambazonian children are not brainwashed into accepting second-class citizenship. It's a bloody shame that any Ambazonian is advocating education to submit young Ambazonians to slavery under citizens of La Republique du Cameroon. This is Lambert Mbom for Ambazonia Calling. What Cameroon has done to us, I want you never to forget. The pain they have brought to bear on this generation, I want you never to forget. Not out of hate, but so that the next generation will remember and make sure they do the things they are supposed to do, never to go through this again. I will continue to play my part to ask the people of Southern Cameroons to take their revolution into their hands and continue the fight to liberate themselves. I'm sorry to say because of France's policies in Africa, in French Africa, the state of La Republique du Cameroon do not have any pressure on them to find a way to resolve this issue because they are always thinking that no matter what happens, France will always be there to give them coverage. Still ahead in this edition, we have the Devil on Mask with Professor Emmanuel Tatamenta. We have a winner of the Nyamfaka of the Week. And we are not done until you have heard our letter to Joshua. So stay tuned, kick back, relax, and enjoy Ambazonia Cola. In today's edition, we have a message for Ambazonians from some of Ambazonia's leadership in jail. We also have an expert on negotiations and mediation who shall remain unnamed. Suffice it to know that he is one of the world's top experts on negotiations and mediation. He will be our guest on The Devil on Mask, which will be delivered today as a series of three papers. Please stay tuned. Chair has got the first part of our news wrap-up for the week, beginning with the online briefing provided to constituents by the U.S. Congressional Delegation, which returned recently to the United States from a visit to the Republic of Cameroon. Members of the U.S. Congressional Delegation that visited La Repubblica du Cameroon last week are briefing interested constituents and Ambazonians regarding their trip. We did that with the goal of delivering the message from the United States that we want to see peace, that we want to see both sides come together and come to the table without conditions. Without conditions, that's very important because, you know, one side or the other is placing conditions. We won't talk until X, Y, and Z. And because we wanted to hear from citizens in the impacted regions. In an opening statement via conference call Friday, Congresswoman Karen Bass, Democrat from California, stated that in spite knowing that Yaoundé was going to be restricting their in-country travel, they had set a goal to visit Cameroon to have a first-hand pulse of the situation. I said I wasn't able to go to the impacted regions, but we certainly heard from people from those regions. Again, people are worried about it being known that they talk to one side or the other. And that's why we have not and will not publicize who we met with. Notably, the congressman revealed that conversations with authorities in Yaoundé touched on Swiss-led mediation efforts. We talked about the status of the ongoing negotiations in Geneva. In a Q&A that followed, the congresswoman refused to uphold the one and indivisible state in favor of self-determination for the people. When you said that you hope to see the nation of Cameroon prosper, I'm curious if that indicates that you would prefer a settlement that would lead to Cameroon remaining united. And similar to that, what message would you have to send to those advocating or fighting for independence? Thank you. You need to know that I always believe is a basic value in the right of people for self-determination. 
adding in a related question that her preference is for African institutions like the AU and other competent players to tackle African problems. As an African American who does work on Africa, it's my dream that the AU will be able to do some of this, that Africans will be able to resolve these problems on their own. As opposed to the U.S. plain world police. Will you look to offer a U.S. resolution that would make the U.S. a key partner in mediating this crisis to bring it to an end? Because that's really where we have to be driving this conversation to. You know we have some issues going on here in Washington, D.C. with this administration. So I, that might be a little difficult on our end to, uh, you know, to say that. I don't know that we're the best partner to, to be in charge of negotiations. Uh, the congresswoman acknowledged the existence of fake Amber Boys. Did you uh, get any information that the government is hiring uh, men or boys who pose as uh, Ambazonian fighters and that there are also some set of uh, fighters who are thieves that uh, the people think that they are restoration fighters? Did you get that information in all your interviews with people on the ground there? Yes, 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 we did. We did get and re-echoed the need for dialogue between colonial La République du Cameroon and Ambazonian restorationists in an atmosphere of peace. I want to see peace in Cameroon. I want to see all sides come to the table without conditions and to work it out. I want people to be free of fear. I want the kids to go back to school. And I want an end to the violence. Already on Tuesday, July 9th, Congressman Ron Kine, Democrat from Wisconsin, briefed members of the press and his constituents in the La Crosse area. It has been nothing short of horrifying, from mass executions to they've weaponized the use of fire to uh, whole villages being raised. Um, and this is being perpetrated pri primarily by the Cameroonian government and their security forces that have come in to crack down on what was initially peaceful protest when it came to the appointment of French-speaking teachers and lawyers and judges in an English-speaking area. You can imagine uh, the type of problems that that would uh, create. Highlighting immediate causes to the disintegration of the Cameroons and the state of the current crisis. Over the last few years, again, we've had the executions, beheading, rape being used as an instrument uh, in this conflict. Again, uh, homes and villages being burnt to the ground young mothers grabbing their young children, fleeing into the bush. We have over half a million displaced people now from these regions. Some have moved internally uh, in country. Others have escaped into Nigeria or found other places of safety and refuge. Mancho BBC has been accused by fellow inmates of extensive collaboration with ex-convict and current La Repubblica du Cameroon Minister of Territorial Administration, Paul Atanganji. Mancho BBC, before the one moved in their community, he met up me and so my other friend, Ekoye Marinos. He said, we did talk about release. We did talk about release. They don't ever release me and I'm a friend because man like me, so I don't keep military. So they... Something they were would they try for understand. I mean, say as this La Republic people, they can't give them money, so they gossip we for the for the La Republic people them. Because Tanganji don't come here like three times. Maybe which why they try for reason them. They tell them say people they like me, so with my other friend, they were all key military. That's why they try for reason them. The audio from jail comes in the wake of calls by Mancho BBC for a full resumption of schools in Ambazonia most of which remains a raging battleground as citizens fight to ward off the genocidal state terrorist army of La Repubblica de Cameroon. Mancho BBC rose to fame as the leader of the Coffin Revolution when the radio show host took to the streets with a coffin to express his readiness to speak and die for the truth about deplorable roads and other infrastructure in the city of Bamenda. He is currently serving a 15-year sentence by the Colonial Kangaroo Military Court in Yaoundé. Human Rights Watch Director for Central Africa, Louis March, says kidnappings and other Geneva Convention violations by Ambazonia volunteer forces are negatively impacting the otherwise genuine grievances expressed by the population. The statement Thursday focused on the kidnapping of Nijon Frundi 
towards the end of June. Frundi was released on June 29th after barely making less than 24 hours with his captors. As days turn into weeks and the international community expresses recognition and support for the Swiss-led initiative to mediate the ongoing conflict in the Cameroons, even members of Brigade Anti-Sardina, Bas, are seeking to modify the content of the Swiss-led negotiation to include Professor Maurice Camto. They dismiss the Swiss platform as non-inclusive unless it includes Professor Maurice Camto. Vous attaquez au Bamileke, vous allez nous trouver sur le chemin. Vous allez nous trouver. Le peu où les Bamileke avaient peur de s'afficher, c'est terminé. Game over. Game over. Members of the opposition coalition, Bas, Code, other colonial Cameroon opposition movements in the diaspora, as well as demand the presence of Mancho BBC, Sisiko Ayuk Tabe, and Co. on the dialogue table. Ambazonians across the board are calling on Bas to fight their fight without seeking to steal away from the independence fight of Ambazonia, as they have done in previous years when the then Anglophones fought and died for multi-partisan, for the GCA board, for more universities, and the greatest beneficiaries have been Cameroonese. Prior to presidential elections in Cameroons in 2018, the French Cameroons acted as if state terrorism and genocide against Southern Cameroonians did not exist. There is hardly any evidence, however, that the Bas request will see the light of day as part of the Swiss-led process. The father of the proclamation of the independence of Southern Cameroons, retired Justice Frederick Alobie de Ebon, has been laid to his final resting place in the D.C. area, United States of America. Ambazonians joined family and friends on Friday and Saturday in funeral activities, including viewing of the corpse, a wake, Catholic mass, and burial. It could be said Justice Ebon rekindled the spirit and lit a torch for the current Ambazonian War of Independence when, almost 20 years ago, on December 30, 1999, at 11.30 p.m., he and a few brave Southern Cameroonians found a way to break security and radio protocols and declared independence of Southern Cameroons over the local airwaves of the government-owned and controlled Cameroon Radio Television, CRTV, leading to his arrest nine days later, ensuing torture, narrow escape to Nigeria, and eventual resettlement as an asylee in the U.S., where he lived out the rest of his life with four grown kids and grandkids in the Maryland area. Ambazonia, land of freedom, you shall live in plenty meat in our need, and your children shall be like the stars above. The most I God be the worst man of this nation. The retired justice never relented in his activism and provided support, particularly to the interim government group, whenever it was solicited. He graduated from the Colonial School of Administration and Magistracy, Enam, in 1975, joined the civil service in 1976, and retired in 2000. He passed on to glory on May 24, 2019. You are listening to Ambazonia Calling, your space for educated news analysis, informed opinions and commentary towards the recognition of a free, independent Ambazonia. I am Innocent Chair. Stay with us. Before we hear the second part of our news wrap-up for the week, please allow me to bring in Barista Manjong Jutambe, who, like many Ambazonians, is wondering why members of the U.S. Congress did not insist on visiting Ambazonia and why they are so keen to talk to officials of the Bia regime but seem not so anxious to speak even to one Ambazonian leader. U.S. Congresswoman Karen Bass confessed that the reason she led a congressional delegation to the Cameroons was to talk to elected and government officials. We met with elected officials 
We met with a government representative. The third group she said she spoke to. And we had meetings with those who are engaged on the Anglophone crisis. She still refers to the genocide as the Anglophone crisis. One can understand the decision by the Honorable Woman's Office to protect the identity of Ambazonians who might have met with her. But we did not call attention to private citizens that we met with, so there might be the perception that we didn't meet with private citizens, but that was, uh, was not the, the, the case. The justification provided by Representative Karen Bass for the trip to Cameroon is, according to her, one of convenience. The unanswered question for Rep. Karen Bass is to find out why the Congressional Black Caucus she leads has not met with the leaders of Ambazonia, who are based in the United States in general and the Washington DC metropolitan area in particular. Further, it should not be lost to most of us that while in Cameroon, she did not ask to meet with Ambazonian leaders held in colonial Cameroon's jails and dungeons. Rep. Karen Bass surely knows that there are two sides to the genocide of violence unfolding in the Cameroons. There are two Cameroons. Two parties are involved. Two peoples. The demand by Representative Karen Bass that everyone should trust her. Trust me, we are listening to all sides. To trust that she is listening to both sides is really hard to believe. Trust me, we are listening to all sides. How fair is it to hear from the colonial regime of Mr. Beer in Washington via its ambassador and then listens to the same individuals during her trip to the Cameroons? Yet, Rep. Karen Bass has never organized a briefing to listen to Ambazonian leaders based in the United States, particularly those who do not mind being identified. Who benefits from such a one-sided approach except the colonial regime of Mr. Paul Beer? Even the call from Representative Karen Bass for dialogue, not negotiations, feeds the kind of narrative and confusion that the Beer regime has been perpetrating. We encourage the government to challenge their fear of opposing voices and to engage in dialogue. The one reassuring message is to hear Congresswoman Karen Bass reiterate her belief in the right of the sovereign people of Ambazonia to self-determination. You need to know that I always believe as a basic value in the right of people for self-determination. Her expressed belief in the right of Ambazonians to self-determination is more logical when married with the recognition that it is for the people themselves to determine their destiny. Again, back with the viewpoint of Cameroonians determining for themselves how to go forward. Representative Karen Bass knows better than anyone else that she would be rendering a huge disservice not only to the Congressional Black Caucus but to the entire Congress of the United States if her choice is to continue listening to one side. Again, back with the viewpoint of Cameroonians determining for themselves how to go forward. There was a time in 1961 when the world ambushed and blindsided Ambazonia into an unhappy colonial marriage with the Republic of Cameroon. The sovereign people of Ambazonia have no intentions in this day and age to allow the international community to impose another choice on them. In fact, the citizens, colonial administrators and occupation forces of La Republic du Cameroon will never decide the destiny of Ambazonia. This is Manjong Jude Ambe for Ambazonia Calling. If you go to Moyuka, nobody they live here. If you go to Munyenge, nobody they stay there. Everybody don't run away because of Muru Muru. But when we pray, oh, revival will take place in Allah. Let's swing right back to the second part of our news wrap-up for the week. Here's Innocent Chair. On confirmed reports from Ambazonia Defense Forces, ADF, about killing five Cameroon terrorist soldiers Saturday have been debunked by La Repugio Cameroon accessory to genocide, Franklin Jume. The ADF Communications Unit claimed that Cameroonese Prime Minister Dion Gute and Paul Tassong, Minister Delegate in charge of planning at the Ministry of Economy, planning and regional development were ambushed as their convoy was heading to Lubialem's southern zone. I say, can't get on this one so bad, you don't grind them all, turn motor for all, scatter it all into pieces. It could cause the city no one to come alive. Divide them into two, scatter them. Now say, they have to pack their bags around them, it's going to be weak. 
Now me cream right talk. Say that king gay. You don't distract for them. Fine. You don't kill them. Fine. Franklin Jume posted pictures of the welcome event of the Prime Minister and the Minister Delegate celebrating with local chiefs. Baretta News has reported that Ambazonia Military Forces, AMF, of General Rambo scored a major victory in Munyenge Friday in a fierce battle against the occupation terrorist forces of La Repluie du Cameroon. The terrorist forces reportedly lost four men and an armored car. No casualties were reported on the part of AMF. The AMF are the only Ambazonian self-defense forces that ever claimed any relationship to the fires at the national oil refinery, Sonara. Barreta News also reported major victories scored by restoration forces in Batibo on Friday. Unconfirmed sources say restoration forces deployed locally made explosives, killing an enemy combatant and destroying a truck. Meantime, Cameroon News Agency on Fon Chanji has reported mortal battles between Ambazonian fighters and the Cameroon military in Biame, a major village in Bui State, northern zone of Ambazonia. According to CNA sources, both sides registered casualties even as unbearable living conditions are worsened by persistent network outages and the absence of electricity. Power and network outages are also reported in Manfe and other parts of the southern zone, where La République du Cameroon has continued to resort to tactics aimed at curtailing the flow of information to the outside world regarding the acts of genocide by the BIA regime. They don't cut network for Manfe because a serious shoot near Manfe now because Ama don't go bomb but we be they did they were not situated be they die or probably I don't sign there. Any fly, anything for Rooney, they shoot them. So don't see this network for Manfi. Reliable sources have confirmed to Ambazonia calling that as many as six paramilitary officers were gone down by volunteer defense forces Tuesday after the BR terrorists invaded fears of restoration forces between Tanko, Ntafuang, and Sankwata in Balinua. It is the first major engagement of the fighters in Bali since they lost their commander, General Acid. In the southern zone, sources are warning Ambazonian freedom fighters to remain vigilant and stay away from a new pro-government militia that has been launched in Kumba. I bring you cavalry greetings from Ground Zero. I have an intelligence about what the colonial SDO and its close collaborators are doing. As at yesterday, they started distributing 3,000 francs each to all the bike riders. With the 3,000 francs each, they will go to Bokum, Bokum, the Trusian Boya Road. On reaching there, they will dish out fuel for them. They will give out the 3,000 francs and they will dish out them fuel for 10,000 francs every Monday to counteract this, uh, the ghost town. Sources confirmed the militia was responsible for a demonstration last Saturday by a group of motorbikers feigning outrage over the killing of one of theirs along the streets of Kumba. The military was reportedly on the sidelines, videotaping the event and gathering information. No, no, no. We, we, it's about violence, it's about violence. We must, we must. On voulait juste vous rendre compte qu'ils sont à notre niveau et ils sont en train de passer pour les films. Et, oui, en tant qu'il y aura plus d'amènes au stade. D'accord, beaucoup. We must. Finally, unimpeachable sources are reporting that former classmates of Father Andrew Ambezier of Bishop Rogan College are being contacted to assist financially even as his state of health continues to deteriorate. The Ambazonian prisoner of war was sentenced alongside the Mancho BBCs and has since reported poor health in the dungeons of Kondangi. He has reportedly received help in the past from his Bambili classmates. Innocent Chair, Ambazonia Calling. Burning our house is so
killing us, them are shooting us, them are raping our children. Wait till we do Friday, the 19th of July 2019, is only five days away. Next Friday is your day off from work and your day on the job for Amazonia. The job at hand is to participate in those worldwide demonstrations that have been scheduled to hold outside the embassies of the United States of America all across the globe. Please join fellow Amazonians in your country of residence for your demonstration. The rally in Washington, D.C. will hold on Capitol Hill. The best way to get there is to hop on the metro and head for Union Station. Capitol Hill is a lazy five-minute walk from Union Station. Joining the brothers on Friday is the very least every one of us based in the DC metro area should and must do for Amazonia. So see you there on Friday. Before we get to the devil on mask, we believe it would be helpful for Amazonians to be all on the same page when it comes to the definition of the concepts of mediation, what it would mean in the context of the Swiss-led process, for instance. Here to begin is a definition of who is a mediator. A mediator is not a judge and does not make a decision or impose a solution to the dispute. Instead, the mediator is a specially trained professional who remains impartial throughout the session and helps guide you and the other party through the most important issues. The mediator manages the mediation session and ultimately helps negotiate a settlement. The mediator also will direct the negotiations with your input. What is the role of a mediator in a mediation process like the one we are about to engage in with La Republique de Cameroun? It's important in mediation that the parties understand that what the mediator is doing, first of all, he's neutral, and he states his neutrality at the start of the mediation. He's there to help facilitate negotiation or conversation between the two parties themselves who end up crafting their own deal. That's a really important part of mediation. It's not trusting the mediator, it's trusting the process. In a successful mediation, the, the interests of the parties are tapped into, and we use those interests to find a result that's satisfactory to both of the parties. What can mediators do, and what are the limits of their role in a mediation? But the mediator is an impartial third party whose job it is is to facilitate the party's communication and negotiation process. Mediators don't have the power to decide, coerce, or enforce mediated agreements. Some have tried to sell the notion that a mediator can determine the outcome, that a mediator can impose or enforce a settlement on parties to the negotiations. Mediation is about conflict resolution, if possible. We cannot force or coerce a mediated settlement. You have probably read the press release issued from Switzerland. Amongst others, the release underlined the fact that the Swiss government has been mandated 
to put in place a mediation process. Again, a process does not exist. It needs to be put in place. Once one is in place, Ambazonia and La Republique can get into the mediation process. The question so many have is, will this process work? While no one except God, of course, can state with a thousand percent certainty what the outcome will be, what is not in dispute is the fact that the mediation process works. There is no issue too complicated for mediation. The process works, and we can come out with a successful result no matter how difficult Welcome to our special interview segment, The Devil on Mask, The Truth Out. Our Devil on Mask segment for this edition is in fact a three-part series of analysis on mediation. What is in store in it for Ambazonia? what Ambazonians can expect from it, what best practice is on mediation leading to the creation of new countries, and as I mentioned at the beginning of the program, our guests will remain unnamed. Innocent Chair has got the first part of our three reports. Now that Ambazonians are committed to a negotiated settlement, they have their work cut out for them. The most important work must include studying what happened to each of the 40 to 50 cases of territories that have battled for independence since the 1990s. Conducting the case studies will not substitute for obtaining the best legal advice. The, the best partners are those who feel most, most comfortable that they've got all the legal facts they need, the advice they, they need, that they understand the options, uh, because, you know, we, there's a lot of theory, a lot of textbooks, but in the end, what there are are 40 or 50 cases, and those cases are real people, real situations, each one a bit different, some with things that are transferable, some that are not. To be successful, Ambazonians must model their case along the lines of the very best cases. That means the dozen cases which effectively ended up in independence. Every single case, with no exception, has involved a willingness to say that the status is, uh, the confirmation of the status is determined as the outcome of the process. If you go too strong, uh, I mean, if you go too weak, then you don't get what you want. If you go too strong, uh, then the other countries think, oh my goodness, we should never recognize them while determining what errors were made by the two dozen who failed and the others who ended up with some form of autonomy instead of independence. The key legal concept that, that will determine uh, the basis for recognition is the legal principle of uti procedetis, you know, right? So that there is the basis on which a determination will be made is whether or not there was a territory that was a subject of international law at some point in the past. There is also, I should say, the so-called remedial rights, uh, which is rights of self-determination apply more strongly in the grey cases where there is a situation of active oppression. While textbooks and theories can be consulted and used wherever possible, it is real-life situations, actual cases involving real countries, that will be the best teacher for Ambazonia. Learn from the best. And you know what several of them did? In all of them had their major problem the internal, the rivalries among each other and the skepticism within their communities. And several of them made a brief charter why are we committed to negotiation, which will be a public document? Why are we uh, committed to attempting a negotiation uh, with the enemy? What will we be negotiating on? One thing is clear. No independence will ever be obtained unless Ambazonia negotiates. I stand for you to correct me, but there's no single successful case where the party has said, we are already independent, we are illegally occupied, and you will do it. They have said, 
they have, our position is we are occupied, we are seeking independent international recognition, we want it confirmed through, uh, through a negotiation. Yet, those who advocate negotiations are the same ones who will be treated as sellouts, black legs, by those who would like to sell themselves to Ambazonians as the tough hawks. Because you will be denounced as traitors. Ambazonians will succeed if they learn from the best cases. There are just incredibly powerful things, if you look at it that way, if you look at all the cases that they have uh, in common. Surprisingly, some of the best cases involve countries that won independence by initially hiding their ultimate goal. This was the case of Kosovo, which hit its red lines in order to secure the participation of Serbia in the negotiations. The Kosovars, the Kosovars never put, that in, which we got to independence, never put on their negotiating platform uh, to the very end that they wanted uh, an independent uh, Republic of Kosovo, as, as they called it. It is only once Serbia was engaged that Kosovo put demands on the table for and ended up obtaining independence. This is Innocentia from Bazonia Calling. Ambazonians expect from a successful mediation. The monk from Ibali Kumato, Vetsukov himself, says mediation would make every wish come true. However, he is certain that Ambazonians can learn the ropes and they can make the political give and take work for the restoration of the independence of Ambazonia. Negotiations will not deliver everything Ambazonians seek. Engaging in them means accepting to engage in political give and take. Even worse, than accepting to make concessions to the other side, most state parties in negotiations with territories seeking independence do not engage in the negotiations in good faith. One never knows the motivation of the adverse party. Frankly, it can be in very bad faith. It's very often in very bad faith. Most states from which the territory is seeking independence engage in negotiations in an effort to spy on the pro-independence movement, to destabilize it, set up movements against each other. It's clear that the principal mo motivation of the government party is to gather intelligence about the enemies. The fact that the government party engages in the negotiations in bad faith should not be a reason for the pro-independence movements to refuse negotiations. Although this was not a revolution about independence, this was the case of the apartheid regime engaging Nelson Mandela and the African National Congress in South Africa. The apartheid regime's desperate effort to divide and rule among anti-apartheid movements boomeranged against the South African regime. It was completely in bad faith. The very last thing they had, well not the very last, but almost the last thing they had in mind was that there would actually be a democratic transition in uh, South Africa. They, they began to open a channel in the hope that they would divide and rule because the ANC was divided between a military wing mainly outside of the country and a political wing mainly inside the country. It was divided between those in prison and those outside of prison, between those in the ANC and those in more radical parties. And then they bumped into Mr. Mandela, <laughs> who began to use a sort of judo move, uh, and finally convinced them, and right to the level of the president, that, you know, it's not going to get any better for you. You've got all the guns and all the money, but it's not getting any better for the apartheid South African thing. And we can talk now about, as uh, people who can deal in good faith, about what a transition would look like. What, what protections would the white community actually get if we settle this peacefully now? And what will happen to you? I mean, let's leave it to your imagination. But let, let, if I could just ask you, Mr. De Klerk, to game it out, where do you think you'll be? in 10 years from now if we don't reach agreement. And slowly, 
a bad faith process became a good faith process. Because the, South Af- the white South Africans decided, <laughs> actually, Mandela is probably right. It probably doesn't get any better. And people can agree or disagree. I think 20, 25, exactly 25 years later, since 94, there are South Africans, black and white, who probably think the agreement was crap, and there are probably people who, you know, the economic freedom fighters, so that it was that the, the, the uh, majority left too much to the the old apartheid regime supporters, and there are probably those in the white community who said we could have continued to fight on for another 10, 15, 20 years. We should have tried it rather than give up. But regardless of how you view about that, there was an evolution from. Um, bad faith to good faith. Even worse than the government negotiating in bad faith, the single biggest threat against the negotiations will be... The single biggest threat will be this outflanking within your own uh, communities. And I think in every successful case that, that I know, it's not only been a relatively broad tent, but it's been a tent with an open flap, an open door. So there will be some who are looking at you with hostility or with jealousy or, or with rivalry. Whatever the case, and no matter the consequences, the advice based on best practices from the 40 to 50 cases is for those pro-independence movements which recognize the right moment to constitute a structure within which the negotiations will take place. There should be a structure where there is, you know, the train can't wait for everybody to get on board. The slight difference is where there is a, a single figure who uh, represents the, the aspirations, you know, a Mandela or a Guzman. But even in the case of Guzman and Mandela, they also went to great pains to broaden the tent beyond their own views and to keep the flap open so that others could, uh, could join them. If you do not do that, if you do not have a basic point of reference among yourselves that you, that despite any rivalries or disagreements that you can agree on and which is compelling to your constituencies, then it will be used against you. This does not have to wait. So those organizations who read the tea leaves should recognize that the only train is about to depart to definitely get on board the train and start rolling out of the station instead of waiting forever until every liberation movement accepts to get on board. This is the monk from Ibalikumato for Ambazonia Calling. So get on now on the train. Everybody get on now on the train. Mothers, fathers get on now on the train. Children get on now on the train. Sister, brothers, get on now on the train. Husbands, wives too, get on now on the train. Oh, Abba, Father, bless us. Oh, Jesus, Christus, guide us. Oh, Holy Spirit, lead us on the restoration journey of our liberty. So, restoration train is our freedom train. If Ambazonia wants to be successful at the mediation table, says Willy Bratade in the following report, it is not too early to start working on unifying their efforts on building cohesion and realizing the need to continue to mobilize international support without which the creation of a new country is an impossibility. Ambazonians are still far away from meeting some of the key needs for successful negotiations. But it is never too early to begin planning for the real deal once the first informal, indirect contacts have been made, as was the case in Switzerland recently. Things that are not agreed by both parties uh, should not go forward. So I think that's another reason, by the way, to have the process discussion first. Now that Ambazonians have signaled their willingness to engage, and the international community has indicated its support for its negotiated settlement, the most urgent need Ambazonians must meet is to unify and, together, finalize a common position, also known as a charter. What I would finish by urging you to consider is some sort of very brief 
charter among yourselves or a statement of why you think it's important to uh, negotiate. Second, a message saying you can't deal on an ad hoc basis. These are important issues too important and you do need a process. Putting together a common position sometimes accentuates divisions instead of smoothening them out. All sides are divided, and that's true in all cases, but it's the nature of opposition, especially when an opposition emerges from an oppression, that it's, it has multiple sources, and therefore it has multiple institutional expressions, and therefore it has multiple rivalries within it. Getting all liberation movements on the same page regarding a charter or common position and having the government party, in this case La République du Cameroon, to accept to go to the negotiating table does not mean victory is coming. Because always recognize sovereign states, always have certain advantages. The structure of the talks has to be such that when opportunities arrive, they can be accelerated or decelerated. You know, if, for example, something terrible happens on the ground, uh, there can be a pause which will consolidate international support, but not bring you back to square one. Without exception, none of the territories which gained independence have ever been able to do so without the support of the international community. It's, it's important to understand that this enterprise cannot succeed without international support. There is no path without international acceptance and without African acceptance. So there is no path without it. Second, the, the successful cases of new state formations are based on uh, legal foundations that are quite similar to your own. So, you know, I, I'm very much not here to encourage or discourage. I'm simply here to say that there is only one path, which is through negotiation and through international acceptance. And um, international recognition has as a necessary but not sufficient foundation a good legal claim. You're in a complicated position because the legal basis is not bad, but the political context is, is not easy. International attention is extremely fickle. The willingness or unwillingness of countries to engage, to uh, recognize, to take position is in constant flux. So uh, opportunities can arise. I think that um, both uh, South Sudan and Eritrea founded. Best practice shows that there is absolutely no path to independence that does not go through the country from which the breakaway republic is quitting. Uh, tremendous lessons here and, and uh, knowing that the path does go through the other side. Amazonians can choose the Swiss-led process which is real and available or they can run after illusions which lead nowhere at all. This is Willie Broad a day for Ambazonia Calling. If you are looking for just a handful of gifted Ambazonian speakers and for the few fearless defenders of our quest for the restoration of the independence of Southern Cameroons, it would be hard, scratch that, it would be impossible to name five persons without mentioning a certain Dr. Lucas Choayaba, whose doctorate of philosophy came through this week. And it would be hard not to mention a certain Abdul Karim Ali. This week, both of them were on a major media blast, with Abdul Karim Ali fighting off efforts on a Cameroon-based TV station where it was being suggested that Ambazonians should settle for a confederation with the colonizers. Here is Abdul Karim Ali delivering the smackdown. Some people have equally been calling for confederation, saying it can be an option uh, that can make the difference uh, since uh, government say secession will not be on the table for discussion. Some advocates or some are advocating for uh, confederation. 
when you look at the, the, the concept of confederation in this particular, uh, particular position that Cameroon finds itself, can it work? Listen, Mr. Meme, we are, we, are, we are not going to negotiate at, at the point of fear. And at the same time, fear is not going to stop us from negotiating. Let me say that again. We are not going to negotiate from, from a point of fear, and fear is not going to stop us from negotiating. Most of these people who are now preaching confederation. I wonder, this this my, my my fellow brothers who call themselves federalists, because they are, they are the ones who migrated now from federalism to confederation. Some maybe, months, maybe some months back, that some the, months back the, the situation, the context have changed. Yeah, this shows that, need no, this shows that they don't understand the Southern Cameroon problem. That is just simple. If you understand it, all this prostitution between forms of governance wouldn't be trickling in your mind. What is confederation? Can you have a confederation between the states? You must have a confederation between two states. First of all, they must be states to confederate. So this even beats their argument. Their own suggestion beats their presuppositions. Because for you to confederate with another state, you must be a country on your own. You're going to enter it with your passport, with your ID, with your currency. So I, I like that. So first of all, let's have independence, and then we, we, we go for confederation. But I think they don't, people, these people preaching these things, number one, they've not, I'm sorry to say this, they don't understand the Southern Cameroon problems. If they did, they'll honestly be preaching one thing now. Just one thing. Which is? Which is solving the root cause of the problem. And the root cause of the problem is that Southern Cameroon was not properly decolonized. Like other African territories under the United Nations Resolution 1608. That is the problem. All these other things of our children don't have jobs, we, we, are, we are being spoken in French in our schools, lawyers are being beaten, all of them are symptoms. I've said this many times and it's worth repeating. They are symptoms of something. If you don't solve that thing, my child will still face the other thing again. Right now, in the northern zone, all you need to do is speak French to the security officers and then they let you. Once you speak French, no matter what, what they, are, what they would punish an indigent for, if you speak French, they'll say, this is a francophone, let him go. This is what they do. So you can see, it's still even at the midst of all this. And I ask myself, what did we do wrong? What, where did we go wrong to have such a treatment? We are the ones who willfully entered a union with the Republic of Cameroon. They didn't come in. We came in. And today, after all what they know that they have been doing, we mention it is killing, beating, maiming, raping, and insult. I've never understood this thing till today. And I wonder why Francophones who are God-fearing have not understood it, understood it the way we are supposed to understand it. Since the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom of God suffered violence. Let the violent one take it by force. Show on the ground king. Boom. With the cry. About what the cry. Don't tire. About what why. Come in and cry. Cry. We are the cry.
most of you would have already heard Dr. Lucas Choyaba's interviews on the BBC and Sky News. We are playing back the interview on the BIPs with our thanks to Dr. Lucas Choyaba and Abdul Karim Ali, of course, for always doing us proud. Here's Dr. Lucas Choyaba on the BBC earlier this week. Five million people are affected by the conflict. Hundreds of thousands are living in the bushes as IDPs. Tens of thousands have moved into Cameroon as refugees. It is extremely bad. It's uh, classified as one of the 10 worst conflicts in the world at this particular moment because uh, villages are being burnt and it's a kind of a scorched earth policy by what I describe a retreating army that has lost legitimacy and political control. Does that at any point make you regret some of the choices taken by the separatists? We have made no choice. It's always a choice to take up arms. No, it's not a choice. Uh, Cameroon has exercised a level of impunity within our country for the past 50 years. Two men have ruled Cameroon and over Amazonia. Two men. I hate you and beer. And beer. And uh, the legitimacy of their power has been derived solely through the use of force. And people have lost their limbs during democratic processes. Uh, students have been summarily executed. And we rose up because we challenged the francophonization of our legal system. We challenged uh, a system where we had to basically sit for exams in half broken French and English. And some people just called for a reformation of the colonial state. And the regime responded with kidnapping of leaders, transporting them to its own legal jurisdiction and declared war on our people. But I think a lot of people would have perhaps had sympathy or more sympathy with you if it had been a peaceful protest, as there have been peaceful protests over the years. No one ever had sympathy towards us for the past 57 years. I organized protest marches for 15 years across Europe, including Downing Street. Nobody listened. And now that your side has taken up arms, people do listen, you're saying? They are listening to save Cameroon, not to recognize Ambazonia. And I am telling them, them it's a historical mistake you are making. How do you respond to the accusations of human rights abuses carried out by separatist forces? When you see the videos of uh, people being tortured, for example, when you see schools deserted because of the separatists' decision to threaten people in the English-speaking areas who go to school, those are not the decisions that a responsible armed force should be making, are they? There is a misconception. Cameroon is the occupying power, and it's a signatory to the 1949 Geneva Convention to ensure that it can provide basic education even for IDPs and refugees. It's also a signatory to the 2015 Safe School Declaration that was uh, sponsored by Norway and Argentina. And we have evidence to show that Cameroon touched down Sacred Heart College in Mancon. We have evidence to show that students in the only university in Boya were doing peaceful protests and shouting no violence. That same night, the regime forces raided student hostels and the university shut down. Sure, but you talked about a school, university, but there are so many schools closed down because of threats by the Amber Boys. No, because of insecurity. So that's not what people there tell us. They say we are threatened by the separatist forces who say you should not be going to school, your children, while we are in the bush fighting. I think there is an assumption that, you know, there is also a difference. You've just talked about Amber Boys. There are organized defense forces that function based on a code of conduct that reflect the spirit of the Geneva Convention. And then you have organized groups that are non-affiliated. Some are even affiliated to the regime in Yaoundé that have been carrying out acts of brutality against civilians. We recognize those acts as inconsistent with the spirit of the Geneva Convention and international humanitarian law. And in situations where we have access we have stopped kidnapping, we have stopped ransom taking. We also have evidence to show that the regime you know, has been decapitating uh, civilians. Sure, but when you see recently um, an archbishop kidnapped for a short period of time, John Frundi, a very famous politician from the area, taken away by our men for a period of time, all this stuff decredibilizes the effort by English-speaking Cameroonians, or Amazonians, you'd say, to have their independent country. The world must make a distinction between the issue of kidnapping and what we term arrest. In the case of John Frundi, I was briefed that uh, because of certain activities, uh, he was taken for interrogation. And so we are fighting for our survival. 
we are fighting for our existence. We do not uh, support enablers who think Ambazonia should remain a colony under Cameroon. When you see senior Cameroonian officials saying, look, we can talk about anything, but we can't discuss our country being divided. We can't discuss secession. What's your response to that? That's how it begins in, in the last phases of most conflict. You talk tough, but the reality on the ground speaks differently. They will have to yield to the inevitable or face the consequences of splintering their own country into pieces, as we are seeing already a part of the western part of Cameroon demanding its own independence. It's an occupying power. It should withdraw from Amazonia, and we will hold them accountable for 58 years of impunity. Don't do foolish, but when there are capital fools out there, we make it our duty to find them, and every week we crown one of them the Nyamfuka of the week. It is that time on the show once more, when the queens and kings of foolish for this week are reviewed and crowned. Here's Veronique Vatimfe. Finishing in third place this week, is the Ambazonia Recognition Council ARC for morphing from an umbrella to a broom. This week, ARC launched an initiative aimed at replicating the same steps leading in the case of Skakuv to the creation of a self-proclaimed interim government. You only have to be a family of five to become known as an ARC satellite. Every Ambazonia must be weary of the room this opens up for any five individuals, including any five working for La Republic, constituting themselves into and calling themselves an ARC satellite. For opening a boulevard for pro Bia regime groups to affiliate with one of the leading umbrellas, ARC is this week's third place finisher for the crown of shame the Nyamfuka of the week. Nyamfuka them all. Finishing in the position of runners-up are the Okada riders of Kumba and neighboring hamlets who have been hired by the colonial regime of Mr. Paul Beer to launch a stupid campaign against Ghost Town. Protected by the occupation forces of Mr. Beer, the Okada riders of Kumba allowed themselves to be infiltrated by soldiers of the Bia regime. Their hope of tricking Ambazonians into thinking that ghost towns have become unpopular only helps to stress the importance of Country Sunday and makes the Okada riders of Kumba this week's second place finishers of the crown of shame, the Nyamfuka of the week. Finishing at the top of the charts of stupidity is the so-called Prime Minister of La Republic, Genocida Enabler-in-Chief, Dion Gute, the rest of the government of colonial Cameroon and officials of the National Assembly. The trio were hopeful this week that by preventing the U.S. congressional delegation from visiting Ambazonia would prevent them from finding out the truth about the genocide unfolding in Ambalan. Restricting the travel of the congressional delegation completely failed preventing members of Congress from finding out exactly what is going on in Ambazonia, including recognizing the regime has its own fake Amber Boys, for seeking to put the toothpaste back into the tube for trying so hard and yet failing to hide atrocity crimes, war crimes, and genocidal violence, Dion Gute is this week's winner of the crown of shame, the Nyamfuka of the week. Nyamfuka them all. This is Veronique Vetimfe for Ambazonia Calling.
It started like a joke and I smiled From Meme to Momo we said no violence Now I know not how to smile Cause my loved ones are gone There is no place to call home Our homes have been burnt I am homeless in my homeland There is no place to call my home Homeless 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 in my homeland When are we going to have a dialogue? We have buried more than enough Like time When are we going to have a dialogue We've been marginalized enough You may fool some people sometime You cannot fool them all the time What happened in Switzerland is big. It is very big for Amazonia. Don't let anyone fool you that Mr. Beer really wants to negotiate. No, he does not. Mr. Beer did not approach the Swiss because he really wants to negotiate. We know that he did it because he thought that he was setting a trap for Amazonia. Mr. Beer wants a Cameroon Cameroonian dialogue in which he is patron. He doesn't want any third party mediated negotiations witnessed by the international community, the EU, the US, the UN, the UK. He does not want that. Mr. Beer just happened to find himself in his own trap. Those who are telling you that they are not ready for negotiations are exactly saying what Foncha said to the United Nations in 1961 that we were not ready for independence, that we wanted a little more time. We don't want any more time. We were ready for independence in 1961. In fact, we were ready for independence before 1961. We are ready for negotiations now. The people who are competent, let them step forward, let them step up to the plate, let them deliver for Amazonia. No more excuses. Keep working, keep striving, never give up, fall down seven times, get up eight. Without commitment, you'll never start. But more importantly, without consistency, you'll never finish. Ease is a greater threat to progress than hardship. Another crack opened up this week on what remains of the fast decaying and increasingly irredeemable Republic of Cameroon. Anonymous sources announced the foundation of what is described as the Federal Republic of the Grassfield, a breakaway republic that will bring together the Bamileke people of the West region of colonial Cameroon. Tanyi Jude Agua Ozugen has been following developments. It never rains, but it pours indeed. Hardly has colonial Cameroon understood what it means for Amazonia to be firmly embarked on restoring its independence than it has to now tackle cessation. News of the creation of the Federal Republic of Grassfield left spin doctors of the BR regime and other television talking heads tongue-tied. When one considers that there has long been talk of a Wajo Republic in the northern parts closest to Chad and of a Fangbeti Republic of the SY South Center region, it is not too early to prepare an epitaph that could read. Here lies the disintegrating SY one and indivisible Cameroon with the key. The Bamili case are up against overwhelming odds. Being an ethnic group isn't a valid legal reason for constituting a territory into a country. While secession is not considered a violation of international law, the principle of territorial integrity and the sanctity of borders inherited from colonization only reinforce the odds. According to the 1970 UN Declaration on Principles of International Law concerning friendly relations and cooperation among states, Colonial Cameroon can actually forfeit a right to a territorial integrity if its government does not represent all the people belonging to the territory without distinction as to race, color, or creed. When there are serious violations of human rights, the disregard of the electoral rights of a group, 
or persistent economic discriminations against it, cessation may be justified, as in the case of Bangladesh. However, to qualify for cessation, the group seeking to establish a breakaway republic must establish a distinctiveness from the dominant group in culture, history, and religion. The new state must occupy a separable territory and cessation will require a referendum to approve it at some point, only if a substantial majority of the group seeking the new republic vote in favor of it. In other words, cessation is not a remedy of first resort. It may be justified only if negotiations with central authorities to redress the legitimate grievances of the group within the national, constitutional, and political order have failed. The Bamlikis have not yet met those criteria, but who knows? They may be establishing the Republic of Grasfi as a first step. No doubt, the closest allies of Amazonians until now, the Bamlikis can no longer count on support from Amazonians. Bamlikis have treated the legitimate campaign of independence of Amazonia with callous indifference. The history of persecution, the genocide of the Bamlikis in the late 1950s and early 1960s and political and economic marginalization of the Bamlikis won't suffice. To make matters worse, Ambazonians view the proclamation of a federal republic of Grasfi as part of some grand master scheme of colonial Cameroon to model the Ambazonian restoration campaign. It is not only hard luck, it is death on arrival. This is Tanya Jude Agua Ozugen from Bazonia Calling. Honorable Joseph Weber made another remarkable appearance at the convention of the SCNC held in London a fortnight ago, and he delivered one of those speeches for which he seems to have a secret formula. Not everyone was pleased by the speech. In fact, some people sent hate mail his way. On her very first assignment on Ambazonia calling, Annie Intam says Ambazonians need to keep their intolerance in check if we are truly hoping to build a democratic Ambazonia. The audio message from a fellow comrade who identified himself as Sama Thomas at the end of his message highlights exactly the manner in which most of the active voices in the fight for our independence have been singing the wrong songs that seek to demotivate rather than inspire our suffering people. Mr. Sama Thomas in his message to Honorable Wilbur in particular and to his bigger audience calls out the man of honor for statements he made in his most recent outing, in which he referred to our comrades who have fallen to the enemy as saints. According to the speaker, Honorable Weber is an underachiever who does not deserve any recognition for his contribution to the collective consciousness and awareness that triggered the ongoing war for independence for the people of, Am of Ambazonia. I understand, Honorable Weber said, Whenever a fellow comrade is captured by the enemy, he becomes a saint. And I think in this context, he makes a point. The Weber bashing I listened to, which was over 15 minutes long, was void of any substance that could positively change Honorable Weber or positively impact the revolution. Our people keep missing the point and even sometimes forget who the enemy is. Let's take this scenario as an indicator. Eric Tato insults every second Ambazonia in one of every two of his live shows and repents every six months, only to resume the bashing with renewed vigor. Other frontline leaders, just like Mr. Tato, also spend so much time fighting against everyone else but La Republique. In standing up at a time and place where his peers could not to speak for his people, Honorable Weber did himself a favor. He wrote his name on the wall of fame in this war of independence for the people of Ambazonia. He shall be remembered long after he would have gone, and the children of Ambazonia who are not yet born shall be taught in schools that, once upon a time, a certain Wilbur stood up for his people. 
If we are so intolerant that we refuse to recognize our own heroes, then the future of Amazonia is dark. There is this old adage, yesterday is history, tomorrow is a mystery, but today is a gift. Amazonians should make the best of today and know that they cannot win the enemy if they spend time fighting against themselves. Reporting from Germany for Ambazonia Calling, my name is Ntam Ani. For whatever reason, far too many non-Ambazonians behave as if they would want to be paid before they can call Ambazonians by the name they have given to themselves. Journalists seem to lead the way in resisting to refer to Ambalan by its independence name. She don't look Makia in the following report delivered in studio by Prince Alem reminds the world that anyone and any country can change his name at any time. Too many armchair journalists who get a chance to interview an Amazonian leader try so hard to avoid calling our people by the name they call themselves and our country by the name we have given our homeland. Journalists who refuse to do their homework before interviewing Amazonian leaders or who show total lack of respect by calling Ambazonia by colonial names should be made to sit up. Ambazonians have a right to change their name and to call themselves by whatever name they prefer at any given time. Every journalist who fails to use the appellations Ambazonian and Ambazonians should be reminded that today's Iran was once Persia, Iraq was once Mesopotamia, Turkey was Constantinople, Bangladesh was once East Pakistan. Gee, Ghana used to be called the Gold Coast. Burkina Faso was once Upper Volta. Namibia used to be Southwest Africa. Malawi was Naisa Land. Zimbabwe was Southern Rhodesia. And least we forget, Congo was Congo before it was Zaire and before he decided to be called the Democratic Republic of Congo. Myanmar was formerly Burma and the colonizers from La Republic had the audacity to rename Victoria Limbe. Have Amazonians prevented anyone from referring to Saigon as Ho Chi Minh City? No foreign journalist or paid agent must be allowed to get away with poorly disguised efforts at referring to Kunta Kinte as Toby. No Amazonian should allow anyone make a mockery of who we are and who we have chosen as our identifier. This is Prince Alem, delivering in studio for Shidong Makia for Ambazonia Calling. This is Ambazonia. One nation, one soul, one people. Sacrificing, bleeding, and yes, dying if need be, until we kick the colonialists out and enthrone a government of the people in Boya. A week ago, we sent a letter on this program to the leadership of Ambazonia in the jails and dungeons of La Republic de Cameroon. We did not expect to hear back from them so soon, given the restrictions to communication for our heroes and sheroes behind bars. But Barista Manjong Judambe, who penned the initial letter to the leadership in jail, has heard back from some of those who reacted to his message. He is here to share the content of the reply with Ambazonians. It is one of the most heartening things to hear back from the Ambazonian heroes and sheroes behind bars. The brave men and women who have given up their liberty in favor of winning total independence for Ambazonia. The reply we got 
came from Ambazonian leaders in the dungeons of colonial Cameroon in Yaoundé. They want us to know that they appreciate the letter we sent to them. They are delighted to note that the people of Ambazonia, those free as well as those living under colonial domination or held behind bars, are united in spirit and determined like never before to stop at nothing until Ambazonia wins outright and unconditional independence and recognition. Here are excerpts from the letter from jail. God has assigned every Ambazonian a special responsibility in this revolution. Wherever they happen to find themselves, including those of us who have been deported to and or have been held behind bars in the jails of colonial Cameroon. Thank you for campaigning for our release, for keeping the world posted on what is happening to us. But please, do not make our loss of freedom consume you too much. You have the most important task of continuing our march to Boya. Keep your focus. Ambazona counts on you. Be not afraid of the challenge before you. God has you out there for a specific reason. Please proceed without us and know that you can count on our prayers. The progress you have made and the achievements of the past two and a half years must be made irreversible. Do not look back, no matter the difficulties that may lie ahead. As for the concern expressed by some of you to condition the start of any negotiations on our release from jail, do not let our continued detention slow our pace to total unconditional independence. On everything you are doing for Ambazonia, proceed with the recognition that the colonizers have made us hostages. In fact, if need be, do not hesitate to proceed as if we were already killed and buried by the regime. Do not let even our death stop you or delay our people's march to Boya. Behave as if we were killed in battle already and negotiate for independence for our people as if we will never join you. Make the victory you win for Ambazonia so beautiful that anyone watching you perform your cavalry duty to our people will know that you seek victory for Ambazonia as if it were also revenge for the evil they have done to us and to all other Ambazonians, especially those of our fellow citizens who have paid the ultimate price. Ambazonia must be free. This is Manjun Judambe with the wordings of a letter from some of our leaders held behind bars in colonial Cameroon for Ambazonia Calling. This is Ambazonia Calling. Because you have your army of occupation out in West Cameroon, you believe that when the people will rise, even if you took the whole of the French army and added to yours, you will never bring them down. And I call on all Cameroon soldiers to lay down their arms within Ambazonia and to turn their arms against the very system that has made them slaves in the land of their birth. For more stories from around the world, go to the World Wide Web at themissionstribune.com, compassfreepress.com, and africafreedomnetwork.com. Here is our letter to Joshua. Dear Joshua, please keep your troubles to yourself. We have enough of our own troubles already. How you manage the rotten affairs of the Bread and Sardine Republic, how you plan to address or not address the palaver brought about by the once supposedly peaceful and quiet Njanga people catching the Amba virus, it seems, is your business. Why do you think we should care? Chaos is the name of the game. The one and indivisible seems to be transforming into the many and perfectly divisible. Without so much as signaling Gafara, the sovereign people of Grafiland have designed an erasing of flag, I am told, to the glory of a new, soon-to-be-bloody secessionist Federal Republic of the Grassfield, which is about to be self-proclaimed. Your regime and the French government, which has no shame for perpetrating that genocide on the Bamileke people in the 1950s and in the 1960s, must be asking yourself, what just happened? This is what happens when some of your citizens join the Brigade anti sadina They get ideas. Do they think you're really going to give them the green light to start off a nation in the middle of the one and indivisible? What lessons have they not learned? Are these not the same people 
who got your bodyguards charged and sentenced by a Swiss court? Are they not the same people who caused you to be declared persona non grata in Switzerland, leading to your gentle deportation? Look, I fully understand that you're preparing to live your life in exile as everyone prepares for retirement. As a political refugee who had just applied for political asylum in Geneva and did not want to be returned to Njanga country, you were absolutely right to be fighting to the nail not to leave that hotel. I mean, the other good reason for the Swiss is they did not want you sitting around in Geneva, exposing yourself to a possible street attack from members of the emboldened anti sadina demonstrators, who would be glad to eat you raw, by the way. No need to reiterate what would happen if you ended up in the hands of Ambazozos in Ambaland. Although I've heard from a few of them who say they would grant you political asylum in a jail in Boya. I am told authorities in Switzerland wanted to evoke the principle of non refoulement de personnes en danger to prolong your stay at the Intercontinental, but they were reminded of the principles of political asylum that you have evoked in your own case to deal with other people. In case your memory is failing you, let me refresh. Do you remember how well you respected the principle of non refoulement in dealing with the Naira 10 and the other Ambazozos from Taraba State? In the absence of a treaty of extradition between Switzerland and Janga Republic, your host simply reverted to rendition. Sounds familiar? Did I hear that your regime was complaining of being victims of state terrorism on the part of the Swiss authorities and the anti sadina Brigade? As your own ex-liar-in-chief, Isa Musa Chiruma, would say, how can you say that? Can you imagine how hell would be paradise if members of the Brigade anti sadina behaved like your pro-regime militia on motorbikes, the ones that invaded Kumba Town over the weekend? Military officers in Mufti masquerading as bike riders armed to their teeth and planning to foil the organization of ghost towns on Monday in Kumba. You will fail. Let me tell you what sabotage looks like. It is when Paul Tasson and your so-called Prime Minister announce that they are going to Labialum only to end up in next door Chang. It is there that they met with internally displaced persons from Labialum while letting the big man in Gola believe that the gang led by the Nyamfaka for life, Franklin Jume, is indeed going to use propaganda and fake amber boys on motorbikes to bring an end to ghost towns in Kumba Town. You don't know K Town, man. Our people have an expression for it. Una never born. Tell the colonial SDO in Kumba that the promotion he thinks he is going to obtain by being an enabler is the same disease that misled him into thinking colonial forces under his command in Kumba could just go up there, burn down Kumba General Hospital, and turn around and accuse the victim of being the arsonist. A promotion, if one were to come, would have no more value than did the medal on the neck of the old man and the medal. No more value than the golden statues that have failed to cause the international community to declare Ambazonia a terrorist project. The real Okada boys of K-Town know not to serve a vampire regime that devours his own. How many bikers have your soldiers executed? This whole joke about the bikes in Kumba going out to kick against Ghost Town remind me of that taxi project with Jean Fauchevet working with a certain Paul Atanganji and the late Lapiro de Manga. That operation when they tried so hard to get the yellow caps back into the streets of Douala in the early 1990s. The Okada riders of K-Town are more intelligent than you think. They know that the colonial regime will not guarantee protection for them, not any more than the regime has ever bothered to guarantee protection for well-known supporters and members of the inner circles of the regime's chop people their money. May I remind every Okada, every taxi driver, every teacher, every lawyer, everyone who is following Ghost Town Mondays, that you will feast and dine with the regime at your own risk. Our people know you all too well, Joshua. They know that once you have used them, you're going to trash them. Like all chaff, they shall be discarded and disregarded. You are in a better place, Joshua, to let the children know the importance of keeping the laws of Ambazonia. In case 
the bike riders of Cape Town forgot. The law in Ambazonia is you shall love Ambazonia with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And you shall love and respect Country Sunday the same way that you honor and respect and keep the Sabbath holy. No greater love shall a bike rider have in Cape Town than to give up any work on Country Sunday to make sure that Ambazonia triumphs. From our studios here in Washington, D.C., our producer is Jeff McCoy. Our music today is from Ken Wanaku, the monk from Balikumato, William Ford, an amber star of blessed memory, Eric Matisse, on the web at soundimage.org, and Prince Ajoa Alemanji of Ajam Sonic Kitron, USA. Ambazonia Calling is a joint production of Africa Freedom Network, The Missions Tribune, and Compass Free Press. You can find us on the web at www.themissionstribune.com www.compassfreepress.com and www.africafreedomnetwork.com Next Sunday is another day. Until then, keep the spirit, keep the faith, keep up the fight for justice and independence for Ambazonia. Stay Amber Strong.